Good evening. Tonight I'm reading from chapter 7 of The Christian Archetype, a Jungian commentary on the life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger. At the beginning of this chapter, there's a brief quote from Dr. Jung, and the footnote for that quote is as follows. Jung unpublished letter quoted in Gerhard Adler, Aspects of Jung's Personality and Work, page 12, and Nikos Kazantzakis, The Saviors of God, page 93. Quote, we discern a crimson line on this earth, a red blood-spattered line which ascends struggling from matter to plants, from plants to animals, from animals to man, unquote. And the young quote at the beginning of chapter 7, Gethsemane, is this. The problem of crucifixion is the beginning of individuation. There is the secret meaning of the Christian symbolism, a path of blood and suffering. This is the image that begins the chapter. It's called Agony in the Garden. It's from the Hours of Catherine of Cleves. The biblical quote is, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto them, Peter, what could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again, and the second time, and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and he left them, and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Matthew 26, 36 through 44. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Luke 22, 43 and 44. In Gethsemane, Christ faces fully the terrible realization that he is destined to be crucified. This destiny is symbolized by the image of the cup, in the Old Testament, this term has two chief usages. The cup of divination from which one draws lots to determine one's destined portion, and the cup of Yahweh's wrath. The psalmist explains, quote, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot, unquote. Psalm 16, 5. Isaiah announces, Awake! Awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which hast drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. Isaiah 51, 17. It is Christ's destined task to drink to the dregs of the cup of Yahweh's wrath, and terrible wrath it is that requires for its satisfaction the torture and death of his own son. Psychologically, this means that it is the ego's task in individuation to assimilate the effects of the primordial psyche. In medieval pictures, figure 14, Christ is often represented as accepting a communion cup and wafer from the hand of God. In medieval pictures, 
Christ is often represented as accepting a communion cup and wafer from the hand of God. That is, he is eating and drinking his own flesh and blood. Gethsemane thus completes the symbolism of the Last Supper. This process corresponds to the ancient image of the Euroboros, the snake that devours its own tail. Quote, in the age-old image of the Euroboros lies the thought of devouring oneself and turning oneself into a circulatory process. The Euroboros is a dramatic symbol for the integration and assimilation of the opposite, i.e. of the shadow. This feedback process is at the same time a symbol of immortality. He symbolizes the one who proceeds from the clash of opposites. There's a footnote. Chrysostom said that Christ was the first to eat his own flesh and drink his own blood at the institution of the Last Supper. That's from C.G. Jung's Mysterium Conjunctionis, Collected Works 14, paragraph 423. Christ's willingness to drink the cup of Yahweh's wrath has the effect of digesting Yahweh's evil thereby transforming him into a loving God. Anyone who assimilates a bit of the collective or archetypal shadow is contributing to the transformation of God. Eric Neumann puts it this way, quote, To the extent that he does live in reality, the whole range of his particular life, the individual is an alchemical retort in which the elements present in the collective are melted down and refashioned to form a new synthesis, which is then offered to the collective. But the predigestion of evil, which he carried out as part of the process of assimilating his shadow, makes him at the same time an agent for the immunization of the collective. An individual shadow is invariably bound up with the collective shadow of his group, and as he digests his own evil, a fragment of the collective evil is invariably co-digested at the same time." Unquote. The Gethsemane experience is plagued by sleepiness. Three of the four figures sleep through the whole event, although Christ pleads with them to stay awake and watch, be alert and vigilant. The same term is used by the apocalyptic Christ, in Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth. The emphasis on wakefulness indicates that the issue at stake is consciousness. Christ is going through an agonia, which is not just an agony, but also an agone, a contest or conflict between flesh and spirit. The message seems to be that to survive the conflict between the opposites, one must either sleep or pray. As a psychological procedure, prayer corresponds to active imagination, whereby one seeks to bring into visibility the psychic image or fantasy that lies behind the conflict of effects. The emerging image often has a redeeming or transforming effect which reconciles the conflicting opposites. The source of inner strength constellated by prayer or active imagination is personified in Luke by the ministering angel, figure 15. This is an etching by Rembrandt. This state of affairs is described in the lines of Holderin. Where danger is, grows also the rescuing power. Or as Jung puts it, quote, the highest and most decisive experience of all is to be alone with one's own self, or whatever else one chooses to call the objectivity of the psyche. The patient must be alone if he is to find out what it is that supports him when he can no longer support himself. Only this experience can give him an indestructible foundation. Concerning the conflict between flesh and spirit, which occurs at Gethsemane, Origen makes an interesting observation. Quote, 
Of the passages in the Gospels which concern the soul of the Savior, it is noticeable that some refer to it under the name of soul and others under the name of spirit. When Scripture wishes to indicate any suffering or trouble that affected him, it does so under the name soul, as when it says, Now is my soul troubled, and my soul is sorrowful even unto death, or no one taketh my soul from me, but I lay it down of myself. On the other hand, he commends into his Father's hands not his soul, but his spirit. And when he says the flesh is weak, he does not say the soul is willing, but the spirit, from which it appears as if the soul were a kind of medium between the weak flesh and the willing spirit. In the suffering of Gethsemane, the conflict between body and spirit is reconciled in the psyche, the medium that unites them. There's a footnote here. Quote, every psychic advance of man arises from the suffering of the soul, unquote, from Psychotherapists or the Clergy, Psychology and Religion, Collected Works 11, paragraph 497. This is an extraction procedure. Its product, the bloody sweat, corresponding to the aqua permanens of the alchemists, a text by the alchemist Gerhard Dorn, illustrates the parallel, quote, the philosophers called their stone animate because at the final operations, by virtue of the power of this most notable fiery mystery, a dark red liquid like blood sweats out drop by drop from their material and their vessel. And for this reason, they have prophesied that in the last days, a most pure or genuine man through whom the world will be freed, will come to earth and will sweat bloody drops of a rosy or a red hue, whereby the world will be redeemed from its fall. In like manner, too, the blood of their stone will free the leprous metals and also men from their diseases. And that is the reason why the stone is called animate, for in the blood of this stone is hidden its soul. For a like reason, they have called it their microcosm because it contains the similitude of all things of this world. And therefore, again, they say that it is animate, as Plato calls the macrocosm anima. Jung gives the following commentary to Dorn's text. Quote, Since the stone represents the homo totus, it is only logical for Dorn to speak of the putissimus homo most true man. When discussing the arcane substance and its bloody sweat, for this is what it is all about. He is the arcanum, the stone and its parallel or prefiguration is Christ in the garden of Gethsemane. This most pure, most true man must be no other than he is, just as argentum putum is unalloyed silver. He must be entirely man a man who knows and possesses everything human and is not adulterated by any influence or admixture from without. This man will appear on earth only in the last days. He cannot be Christ, for Christ by his blood has already redeemed the world from the consequences of the fall. On no account is it a question here of a future Christ and Salvatore Macrocosmi but rather of the alchemical servitor cosmi, preserver of the cosmos, representing the still unconscious idea of the whole and complete man who shall bring about what the sacrificial death of Christ has obviously left unfinished, namely the deliverance of the world from evil. Like Christ, he will sweat a redeeming blood, but it is rose-colored, not natural or ordinary blood but symbolic blood, a psychic substance, the manifestation of a certain kind of eros, which unifies the individual as well as the multitude in the sign of the rose and makes them whole, unquote. And so that is the end of chapter seven of The Christian Archetype, a Jungian commentary on the life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger. This is published by Inner City Books.